Welcome back, everyone. I am so excited for today's interview. We have a very well-loved USA Today best-selling author who has written over 40 contemporary and epic fantasy romances. We are talking to the one and only Sarah M. Craddit. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. Now, I want to I wanna go straight back to the start. I want to find out what gave you the inspiration to write your first book and how you found publishing for the first time. Uh, I've been writing since I was a kid. My mom was an excellent storyteller. Like she would, she would read books that were when I was younger and before I could read books at the level she was reading them. And she would tell this, retell the story to me in this fabulous way that made me really interested in, um, in storytelling in general, but just creation and, and creativity. And so I've been writing since I was a kid. Um, my first book though, <laughs> I started it, it, um, just a line popped into my head, just a sentence. And I, I took that sentence and I was like, I think I need to do something with the sentence. Uh, and then it took me 10 years to write this book. It's not a book that should take 10 years. When you read it, don't, you know, you, you're going to look at that and go, how did that take her 10 years to write this? <laughs> it's not that, it's not that complicated, but it was my head. It was getting in my head, you know, that, that this isn't good enough. You've got to keep trying. You have to, you go have to go to the 87th draft that you have to keep pushing. Uh, and it was my husband who actually got me into publishing because, because that, that voice in my head was so damaging in a lot of ways. He, uh, he was like, I can't think of who it was, but he had found an article about um, some self-publishing sensation who was making millions. And this was in 20 or middle, middle 2011. So that, that was kind of at the very first start of that big wave. And um, I was like, I don't know. And he said, well, let, let me help you with it. And um, yeah, so I mean, I kind of have him to thank because he got me into it. Now, ever since then, it's been, you know, I've learned to become an epic business manager <laughs> running my own uh my own company basically um but it, he was the one that got me started and how did you go overcoming that self-doubt and building your confidence because for some authors they can pick it up like that whereas for some of us it takes a little bit longer and you, as you said you had that 10 years of resistance is this good enough do I need to keep editing when was the moment where you felt this is real. I am an author. When you found that confidence in yourself to say that proudly, <laughs> you know, if that's so funny, because I think a lot of us are proud of it, but don't want to say, it. <laughs> you know, I still, when, it, when people ask me what I do for a living, I don't always share that. Um, but, you know, I think, I, I don't know. I, I want to say it was when probably a few years into it that I was, um, some of my coworkers at work got wind of it. And it wasn't a secret. I was, I was running in a pen name. I mean, my name is my name, but I didn't advertise it. And and I was in a position at work where a lot of, um, I got a lot of business requests from outside companies and those guys would look me up <laughs> and they'd be like, and you're a best-selling author and this and that. And it just got, actually became kind of a running joke at work because everybody knew that people were going to try to solicit business by trying to like pander to my apparent ego. <laughs> um but I think it was around that time because everybody made me feel so comfortable about it. Nobody made fun of me. I, I mean, not that anybody would, but I was kind of expecting people to go, oh, you write books, <laughs> you know, and nobody did. Everybody's like, that's so cool. And, and that kind of gave me the confidence to speak more openly about it. And I think then, you know, a few years more and I started to feel like, you know, I've been doing this long enough that there's no reason why I, I shouldn't feel as good about this um, as I probably should, you know. It's very interesting hearing everyone's stories because there's always kind of a half moment or there's a nurturing space, as you said, with your colleagues where they really embrace that. And I think especially when people start off in this industry, they are quite coy about it, unless they've had a business plan for the last 12 months and then right. really raring to go. A lot of us are, well, some of us aren't. I wasn't like that. I don't know if you. I wasn't. <laughs> I, I think that there are, there's two types of people in this industry and they have the 12-month business plan prior to the debut novel or there's the one that just kind of publishes and then realises there's so much more to happen and then you learn what running yes. a business looks like. Um, but that's amazing that you found that as well and you were able to overcome that previous resistance. That's awesome. I really want that cover that I have seen everywhere on Instagram is The Raven and the Rush, which comes out December 14th, so not long now, which is amazing. The cover is stunning. It's everywhere on social media, so well done. Um, I Thank would you. love to hear, for the viewers that are watching, what is that book about and why should we be one-clicking it now? So at first I do want to plug Melissa Stevens of The Illustrated Author for that cover because she freaking killed it. <laughs> I, I gave her like this very rough idea and she just nailed it. 
Um, well, so the series is a bunch of interconnected standalones um, within the Kingdom of the White Sea world. So every single one is a different story. And the Raven of the Rush is um, about Evra and Rosen. They're, it's a different world story. Uh, Evra is a, a second son who is happy to be a second son, doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> Um, and he ends up getting elevated to the top role and he inherits a kingdom that is just rife with plague. Um, and it's like that because his father was essentially burning witches and didn't want to bring magic in to help his people. And so he's kind of in between the whole, if I do, if I fix this, I have a civil war. If I don't, then people die. So he gets this idea to go, um, up north, way, way far from home, and meet Rosen, who, um, who is from the Ravenwoods, who are these uh, shape-shifting sorceresses that live high in the mountains, uh, never come down, really, never, you know, integrate. Um, and he intends to go up there and just be like, hey, I need your help. Uh, you're coming with me. And it's like love at first sight. And he has to wrestle with what he's, um, like, what he's going to do about that, you know, whether he's going to go through with getting her to go with him or whether he's going to, you know, follow his heart. Um, and it's a pretty intense story. I really enjoyed writing it. Oh, I'm so excited. And the girl <laughs> is so pretty as well. I know, I definitely know I'm grabbing an AM. Paperback. I'm so excited for that. And so what does your writing process look like? Are you a plotter? Are you a pantser? Do you work nine till five? What do you, what's your routine look like? Uh, I'm definitely a plotter, but I would say uh, a discovery plotter. So I think, I think that's, I've heard Brandon Sanderson say that, you know, that he's, partial discovery writer. Um, I, I like the, I need the structure um, to keep myself from going too off track. Cause I tend to meander if I don't have, like I need to know where the rise and fall of action is happening or I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go completely <laughs> off script. So, but when I'm writing the characters obviously come alive. They, they talk to me, they wanna do something different. And so I allow enough room for that. Um, so I do my initial high level, like here's the story beats. And then as I'm writing, I kind of outline one chunk at a time so that my story can kind of evolve with that and so my my rough my first drafts are about like 80 percent of the way there for books they're, they're pretty close to what they're going to be when they're published uh, and I work in the morning so I get up early and I write for a couple hours and then I usually uh, write for a couple hours after dinner um, and then throughout the day I'm working my corporate job I work from home so that's nice um, but you know any, any other hours I'm working on book stuff it's like marketing and all the, all the business stuff that we have to do we don't have a choice <laughs> do you do you mind if I ask what you do what your corporate job is if that's okay you don't have to answer yeah you can it's not it's not terribly glamorous I just run um I run a, a consumer experience for a, a financial technical company that sounds kind of cool though it, okay it is kind of cool it's uh it's just one of those jobs that's very hard to explain to people yeah. and um even oh, my dad that's a running joke in my family that every year at Christmas my dad will be like what do you do again <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't understand it either um but it, it is kind of a cool job and I actually use um I get to use my creativity in that job too which is nice but I also have get to use my organized brain which is um which always needs to be <laughs> that always needs to be tapped into yeah so then it's quite how do you find work-life balance when you know sometimes it's a little bit harder to juggle when you have a secondary job as well so how do you go with balance uh, rigor and regimen I I there were two years between my first published book and my second published book because I just could not figure out how to get I mean I would come home from work and be exhausted I'd be be you know um and then over time I got better at that but I never it, it still was like it was my I have highs and lows uh and it wasn't until I really started introducing um real structure like this is what you're going to do now and um you know I have I have focus issues like everybody else. Uh, I have ADHD, uh, like real ADHD. And so that, that can be challenged too. But when you learn to work with your brain, you know, like it's uh, Becca Syme does the right, better, faster stuff that is and the strengths for writers, which is so helpful to try to understand, like, don't try to just cause somebody else has success organizing their time this way. doesn't mean you're going to. And once I learned how my brain worked and how to trick it into being productive, pretty much all the time, um, I was able to get a lot more done and I could start setting deadlines far in the future because it used to be I couldn't do that. I would start writing the book and halfway through I'd go, okay, I think I can release this in December or whatever. And now I've got my calendar through 2023. So, um, but yeah, it's it's tough, um, I, you know, but really it's, it's discipline and, and being willing to sacrifice time for other things. 
Yeah, your readers are going to love so much hearing right now. Don't worry, guys. I've got you until 2023. We know it's coming out. We know <laughs> they're going to love it. Yep. I've read too as well. You just celebrated um, your 10 year anniversary, which is amazing. Congratulations. I did. Thank you. Um, we, and I noticed too, that you had on your blog and you, I need to compliment you on your website because there is so much information on there and it's so amazing. And you Thank even you. have a regular blog, which is awesome to see. Um, and I saw that you posted on there sort of like 10 lessons that you've learned in the last decade. I'd love to hear about some of those. I'm really intrigued as to what, what the biggest lessons for you were. Um, yeah, I think, well, I, I think one of them is what I just mentioned that we're all different and you can listen to authors all day long, talk about what worked for them. And I love to hear it because, um, I want to know, right. I want to know what they're doing. I want to try to try to use some of that and then, and make it my own. Um, but even then you have to be in a place where you can understand, okay, that's because they write small town romance. I don't write small town romance. I write epic fantasy and and you have to be able to understand what's going to work and what's not going to work and that's a that's a discipline you have to learn it's like <laughs> I, I threw away so much money and time trying to figure it out um so I think it's just being open to that knowing that don't just take everything you say write it down and do it like think about how that applies to your brand um and that's the other piece of that is brand like know who you are I didn't know who I was when I started publishing I certainly wasn't writing to outlines in the beginning I um I could not even really tell you in the beginning what genre the books were. They were kind of all over the place. And I went back and I cleaned them up over the years, but it wasn't until I started really uh, getting to the end of that world and, and starting the world I'm in now, the kingdom world, that I realized how you know important it was to have a clear identity, know who your readers are, know who you are. Um, your branding should match all of that, your covers, your blurb, um, the, the word choices, the tropes, like all that stuff should be really a, a tight package. Um, and it saves you a lot of, a lot of headache <laughs> if you know that early on and you're not, you're not chasing it and trying to correct it and, and come, come back from it. Right. Um, I've definitely found a lot more, a, a, a more, um, more passionate audience with Epic Fantasy because I've done that than I did. And I have a lot of readers on the other series, but it's different. Um, than I think it is about the ones that I have now who, who want to talk about the books and who are excited because the packaging is all where it needs to be you know and I think that again I think this is so relatable for a lot of authors as well I know I did the exact same thing as you you know it wasn't until I had a couple of different books or I was exploring different genres and then you know you've published 10 plus books and thought I oh, know <laughs> what what does this look like for me outside because yeah. you're just trying to figure out who you are as a writer as well and I think too eventually you kind of find the niches that work for you the flavor like the the theme that you enjoy most as you said epic fantasy I love epic fantasy too so I can't wait to read them um but it's just it's amazing that you were able to find that too and I love too that this is a decade of work for you as well like for authors who are just coming into this it's just a reiteration that this is not as I say it's not a sprint like it's a marathon it's mm -hmm. a long-term thing to consider um and yeah even if you do sort of stumble a little bit at the start it's all right you got plenty of time even though we always feel yeah. like you have time you got plenty of time Right. Well, and learn from the mistakes of those of us who have been doing it a little longer and have not didn't have the the wealth of resources that are available now from just all these amazing author groups and the conferences and the books. So many great nonfiction books out there about craft and marketing and stuff that didn't exist at all in any form in 2011. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've mentored a few newer authors that just don't just just bypass all these things. Don't don't you don't need to go through this pain. <laughs> No, just get there you know I love and I find what's interesting too and you would have noticed this as well the the changes in the industry you know within even 10 years how much it's shifted how how you have to keep up with it how what used to work yeah. doesn't work anymore I think that's one of the most um sort of intense things I want to say about choosing this as a long-term career and treating it as a business is you have to keep up with what's happening in the market and it's just yep insane how quickly it changes yeah it's a business it's not I mean it's a passion but it's a business you know absolutely how do you find actually with is there do you have segregated times as you said you're very diligent with your time schedule have you segregated particular times to do admin type things like I will write between this time and then I will do business things this time how does that look for you 
Sort of. I, I um, actually, this is, I can't take credit for this because this is another thing that I learned from Becca Slim, but I, um, in the morning, I don't do anything social media related. I don't do anything else. I get up, I get ready. I take the dogs out and then I come in. I write. Um, and I do that before anything else. So that that's the first thing I'm really thinking about in any kind of depth. Uh, and once I've gotten, I don't know, a couple thousand words in, then I will let myself switch over to like managing my my ads or um, going through my monsters to do list or whatever else. Uh, then I'll let myself do that for a little while, and then I'll try to come back to writing if I have time um, a little bit after that. But I, I always try to get my words in first because if I don't, I'm my brain will immediately be just worrying around all the things I need to get done. You do one thing, it makes you think of two other things. You know, <laughs> that's a healthy. I should actually. Um try that because I used to do it years ago and now I've noticed that like my routines change and that's the thing your routine changes often as well yeah but you're right, when it's the first thing that you're doing you don't have any sort of outside implications so it's uh, something I should look back into actually <laughs> um, yeah I, well and it's easy to get off track but once you do it you really you see that you see the difference yeah how how big are your books roughly and how how like do you write them within a couple of months does it take you a year so I write about, depending on the month, between 40,000 and 60,000 words a month. So it really, and it really depends on whether I'm in a, in a active writing month or if I'm in between and doing, you know, getting ready for a, a release. Like next month, I won't be doing as much writing because I'll be focused on the release. Um, so the, the Kingdom of the White Sea trilogy, they're very long books. Um, they're between 170 and like 200 and 50 or something like that they're pretty long they're 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 big um these books that are in the the new series the standalones um the series is called the book of all things it they're all going to be like regular average length books so between like 80,000 and 110,000 so some of them might be a little longer but they're not going to be super long so yeah about two months two and a half to three months sometimes to write the books um although I did <laughs> I did write the last kingdom book, which is the longest one in three months. I'm not really sure how I did that, but <laughs> what was its word count? At like 250 or something, 260. It, it, was, it was very long. It, so I'll tell you how long it was. It was five pages short of being the longest book you're allowed to publish on KDB in print. <laughs> I hope my word counted. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> now I know what I now I know where my limits are. <laughs> the paperback must be so thick it's really big yeah it's pretty big and it's and it's it's the large it's a six by nine too it's not a it's not like a it's a big book yeah that's amazing your readers must love you though you're like here you are read that and then, although I'd like to say read that this will be a month for you but it's probably going to be like two days for a lot of them it's crazy how quickly people read I'm I know a reader. I'm so envious <laughs> I know. Well, I couldn't be a, I mean, I, I, I could never write like one a month. You know, I, I couldn't do that. Um, even, even with the, even if I had the word count, right. Like I just, I have to think about books for a while too. Absolutely. One thing that I found amazing on your website, again, like many things, as I said, I absolutely love your website, um, is that you also love traveling um, and you write a like a travel blog. Can you tell me a little bit about that? I'd love to hear about what your favorite country has been to visit as well and why. Um, yeah, I don't I haven't updated that the, the travel part in a while. Uh, and I'm not as good with my blog as I used to be. I used to love writing for my blog. Um, just see, it's one of those things that I don't get as much time for, but, um, yeah, I, the reason I started writing the travel articles was because I was doing a lot of long layovers on my, um, my, my work trips and I didn't want to waste them. So I would go, like I did Vienna that way and Budapest and, you know, you can actually see a lot in 36 hours if you're willing to stay up and you're willing to, to crush it. Um, and so I wanted to write those guides, like, don't, don't give up this time, go use it. Um, I don't know my favorite country. It's tough. I, I love Scotland. Um, that's probably one of my most favorite countries on earth. I would love to come to Australia. I have not been there, um, but I will. <laughs> I will come there. Where did you uh, visit in Scotland? All over. I took a longer trip and yeah, road tripped it all over the country. Amazing. I am. Um, before COVID, I was living in Edinburgh, Scotland. I too love it. So jealous. <laughs> so jealous. <laughs> amazing. So amazing. Um, yeah, which I just find interesting. And I find like 
the for example even the highlands which i'm assuming you went through you did like mm-hmm. a highland tour or something like that i found it so inspiring for my writing as well because you just really have that element yeah. of magic and especially i find when you're writing epic fantasy um you do seem to absorb a lot of that and sort of take it take it in and sort of this is a wrong word to use but regurgitate it back into your books that's that yeah is- no you're right have you yeah, found- the Isle of Sky is probably my favorite place in the whole world. And it is pure magic. I actually just got back from Iceland, which was actually very similar to Sky in, in some places anyway. And it's the same thing. I remember you're just, just standing there and you're thinking, this is like being on another planet. It is not real. It cannot be real. And then you think, that's how I'm going to describe it <laughs> in my books. You know, I, now, I, now I know how it looks and now I know how it's going to, how it feels. So now I'm going to put it into words. I also read somewhere that you like fast German cars and expensive lattes. <laughs> Not right. yeah. yeah, we don't have kids, so we drive uh, BMW and Porsche. Um, you know, I just love, I love German cars. I've been to Germany a few times. Um, you know, just a, it's just an expensive hobby. <laughs> and I, yeah, I just, yeah, my husband gets on me about the lattes because... <laughs> I have a very nice Nespresso machine. I use it almost every day, but I always go to Starbucks. I always end up there anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, not every day, but like I, you know, I, I was like, it's going to pay for itself. And it, it did. Um, but, you know, I still go to Starbucks two times a week too. So it's not a complete replacement. Do you ever work at cafes or anything like that? I can't do that. I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually not one of those authors who can sit and write in a public place. I, I can write on airplanes as long as I'm like sitting somewhere where it's not like I can do it in first class where I have some space and somebody's not literally standing looking over my shoulder um although I used to have little templates I'd pull up when people did that that were really horrifying things I'd write like one of them was like uh like Pokemon can I say this the (laughs) P-O-R-N Pokemon porn (laughs) I was a joke I mean I, I just wanted to like kind of show them this is this is it's rude it's rude to read people's things and now you're going to regret that <laughs> that's so funny I remember once actually I was on a um, similar thing flight for um, a work conference and I was writing because I'm like I need to get time and everyone knew that I wrote as well but everyone was looking over and they're just like are oh, you writing another dirty book and you're like actually I am can you like not and they're like oh oh really and I'm just like why are you trying to make me uncomfortable this is what I do like for a living right that down immediately <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's like it's actually kind of like reading a book uh or even watching watching a movie on a plane and you get to like an adult part of it and yeah. you just kind of feel you're so aware of everybody around you <laughs> like should, you just kind of want to hide because you know it's not so it's just so awkward but writing it's worse because then it's you're the one who's doing it and you know, yeah, I, I can't, I've never written a dirty scene on a plane and I won't <laughs> for that reason. Sometimes when like those scenes come up in the planes, you just want to tell everyone, oh, I didn't know this was going to be in here. I didn't know this isn't, uh, don't watch I know, it. or you're watching the movie and you're like, can I dim the, can I dim this? <laughs> <laughs> Is everyone else sleeping? I hope they're sleeping. I know there's somebody that's watching though. <laughs> um, what has been then your favourite book to write? Out of all the books that you've written so far, what was your favorite? Well, I love The Kingless Crown. That was, that felt like, that felt right. You know, I mean, everything I've written has been something I wanted to write. I've never written for trends per se or to market. Um, They've all been passion projects. Um, But The Kingless Crown was also to market, which, um, and I felt that when I was writing it, I felt like I can write what I, what I love but I can also write something that I know is popular and people are going to like, um, hopefully going to like. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it just felt, it felt, I felt such a sense of accomplishment. You know, epic fantasy is a tough genre. Um, there's a lot of greats in there that have been there for many years. It's, you feel like you're walking amongst dinosaurs. And I mean that in a respectful way. Like these are the folks who, who were, who, who were here already. And um, I wrote that book and I said, this is, this is it. Like this is, this, this belongs in that same list, you know, and I felt really good about it. And the whole series, I mean, I felt about the whole series, but the writing the first book was such a special feeling for me to know I advanced to that place where I could feel confident writing something like that and not just like a poser, you know. <laughs> well, who are, who are some of the authors that you look up to? Oh, there's so many. I mean, I love Anne Rice. I mean, she's awesome. I mean, she's really who got me into writing the way I write. 
you know, the descriptive way of writing, because reading her books when I was a teenager was like, it just opened up. It was like a flower blooming. Like that is, that is, that's how you get um, a point across. That's how you bring somebody into the story, you know, and, and like Stephen King's good at that when it comes to like dialogue and pacing, but she's really good at those descriptions. And, and um, you know, I've had the opportunity to just spend some time with her, um, you know, when she was doing, when she was still doing the undead con in New Orleans and the balls and stuff. And she's really generous with her time. Um, and she's just a wonderful woman. Um, and then Brandon Sanderson, I mean, he puts those courses, those uh, fantasy writing courses up on YouTube for free, or maybe it's uh, BYU that puts them up for free, but that's his, you know, like he, he's he, every year he, or every term he comes in and teaches this class. And um, you know, some of it's, it's, it's very, some of it's very like basic level, but some of it is so, I mean, to hear the way he thinks about his fantasy and the way he structured his fantasy, I mean, he's one of the greats. So, you know, give, that's a gift, you know, and when authors are willing to give those gifts, I, I think you have to accept them and, and be grateful for that and, um, you know, take what you can get. Speaking of paying forward and giving back, you actually have a author program on your website as well very similar like giving back in the same sense can you tell us a little bit about that and why you decided to start doing that yeah um I need to revamp it it's it's kind of gotten a little bit pushed by the wayside but it was a way to make sure that I could showcase other authors and and get them out there I mean we're it's a, it's a it can be a very lonely profession you know <laughs> um and it's also just I I think this is one of those industries where you have infinite opportunities to empower other women, especially, but really anybody, but especially women, right? Um, and lift them up and um, and succeed together, right? Like it's not it's not like buying a house. When when a reader buys a book, they want to read another book, and you know if if you've helped them find that other book, then you've only done them a favor. A reader who reads more reads more and more and more and more. Um, and a writer who writes more is somebody who is, um, who's doing what they love. And so I, you know, I, I always try to set aside time to help other authors when I can. Um, I did just create a Facebook page for sharing fantasy authors, uh, Queens of Fantasy with Rebecca Garcia and Kale Kolarik. Um, the three of us manage that page and really it's for sharing anything fantasy related, um, that, that helps, you know, again, the rising tide lifts all boats, <laughs> Uh, mentality so when you're talking about it I can hear how passionate you are about resharing and especially when you're saying empowering women as well because it is it's very interesting I find being a woman who writes fantasy as well because I think generations ago really epic fantasy was only written by men or should yeah. I say was mostly published by men so we've really shifted the terrain a little bit by bringing out what own works out I want to say so I'm really um really happy and supportive of what you're doing that's awesome yeah I, I agree with you it, it has been it is shifting and I think there's a lot of really talented women in fantasy and I'm happy to see that um and happy to see them get the recognition for that and, and empowering other women is something I am very passionate about and could go on forever so I won't um but especially in this industry I think there's a lot of opportunity for that one thing that I also found super cool is that your audio um your books are converted to audio as well how did you find um that process what did that look like for you so there's kind of been two different paths the my house of crimson and clover books um I want to say there's like 12 or 13 of them in audio. Uh, I did that through, um, through Amazon's uh, ACX program. So I, I have a narrator there, Lori Kane. She's awesome. Or she goes by Elsie Kane is her um, narrator name. Um, and she, we did a royalty share. So she, um, you know, she's just been really, really great to work with. And you, you kind of hear her voice. She gets even more like a, like comfortable with the series as she goes on and, and she's just like can't imagine anybody else narrating that series um with the kingdom trilogy though i was approached um by orange sky who are a division of find a way um find, and they um they wanted to option the the books for audio and um i you know it was kind of i i had never been through that with audio so i wasn't really sure what to expect but it was a really smooth process and um you know they're really they're really been fun to work with but the narrator Kimberly Weatherell, she is awesome and she's extremely active on social media and she's always posting about her progress. So if you ever want to see how it's just kind of fun to go read how she's reacting to certain scenes and how, how it's going with her. 
Um, but it's good. The first one comes out this month. What is the day? <laughs> this month. <laughs> the 23rd. I was like, wait a second. Is it later in the month than I thought it was? <laughs> uh, it's definitely later in the year than I thought it was. What year is it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh it comes out 23rd which i'm excited about and i think that they're going to be a pretty rapid succession for the next two um and her she's an ex- excellent narrator so um yeah and i did just see where uh, find a way was purchased by spotify so um i'm not sure what, what that where that's gonna go but that's kind of interesting yeah that's really interesting i didn't know that that's awesome so where yeah, i think that just hit oh coming in hot (laughs) what then would you say obviously it's still fresh with findaways but which would you is there one that you would advocate over the other a little bit more in regards to sort of process or you kind of found them both equally pleasing well it's been really nice to have somebody else handle everything (laughs) um I don't really have to do I mean other than you know supporting the marketing and um you know providing different pieces of information and stuff like I it's been really refreshing. I guess, you know, I mean, as somebody who's been a one woman show for a lot of, for most of the, my business for so long, it's like, ha, huh, it's nice to just hand that piece over. Uh, and they're just a super cool team to work with too. So I, you know, I probably that probably that experience, um, would be my favorite, my preferable one, but, um, there's so many new, new options for audio now that, um, I don't know, I've got some homework to do for next year for the books that I'll already have in audio. Yeah, that's exciting. You are also very interactive with your readers, which I love. I love your Facebook group as well. It's so, and as you said, your brand is very on point and that carries through in there as well. And I was actually wondering what your most memorable reader interaction has been. I don't know about one interaction in particular, although I did did one time have somebody in what, this was a few years ago in my reader group um, who read my books, who was like, do you realize I live across the street from you? I said, I thought she was joking. And uh, no, she was not. She was my neighbor. I just didn't know her. Um, so that was weird. Uh, and I've had stuff like that happen. Like my, you know, my nieces or nephews will say, they didn't realize that you were my aunt. And I'm like, they don't really read my books, do they? Like, that's it just, you, you can't quite accept that, that that could be the case. Um, but I think for me, it's been any time somebody said like, hey, your book got me through a tough time or you know, it really resonated with me or it made me cry. I mean, no offense <laughs> to readers, but that, no, that means that I, that that's, that's what I was trying to do. I wanted to evoke an emotion and that's why we read is to feel things. And, um, if I, if I succeed in that, then I feel really good about that. And, um, you know, but you know, it is, I, I like to be accessible to readers and there's, there's ups and downs to that, but that's one of the things that, you know, I learned from Anne Rice. I mean, she's always been uh, not as much now. I think she's kind of been more, um, you know, look quieter lately, but she's always been so accessible. And I think that that's been part of um, why people are so excited to be a part of her world. It's actually a community. It's not just, not just fans, they're a community. And, um, you know, I mean, that's not something I can create. <laughs> they have, like, people have to decide to do that, but if they did, I would be happy to be part of that because, you know, I, I think that that's, that's, that's one of the fun parts of writing. And speaking of fun parts of writing, you are a USA Today bestselling author, which is a phenomenal feat. So congratulations. What was, when was the moment that you found out that you were on the list? And most importantly, how did you celebrate? So I was in, um, I was in Arizona on a business trip and I had just, my flight had just landed and I was trying, I had to go like straight to the office, but my phone was blowing up, like blowing up. And so I, I thought, well, I can't go straight to the office. My phone's blowing up. So I, I like pulled over in the parking lot and I read my messages and that's when I found out. And I was like, cool, that's cool. And, <laughs> and then I had to go to the office and I, ha- I guess I almost had this big smile on my face because both my bosses were like, what happened? what's going on with you? And I told them and they were so happy for me. One of those bosses, actually, I still work for. I followed him to Philly. That's how much I liked working for him. Um, but it was just, they were so supportive. And I and I was just stunned. I like, can't believe this is happening. Did you go out for dinner or did you buy yourself something? Because we tell one another we have to celebrate all the time. So did you do something special for yourself? I didn't. I, you know, I was really bad at celebrating back then. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with the whole imposter syndrome piece that can happen to like is this really a big deal or not it's just me or and it's stupid we should ignore those thoughts but they they happen but I have been better about it lately I do celebrate the big stuff I celebrated my tenure 
you know, but I, yeah, no, I, I just kind of grinned through the rest of my meetings and <laughs> that was that. <laughs> what book was that for? Uh, it was for a collection that I was in that I helped manage. Um, I forget the exact one it was. It was one of the red hot collections. Um, and then we hit it three more times. So it was kind of, it was kind of wow. cool. That's amazing. Uh, did you celebrate the second or the third time at least? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I like I said, it's better now, but I was really bad at that. You know, it also just feels sometimes when you're celebrating stuff like that, when it, it's like, it, I don't feel this way as much now, but then it was like, a little bit too self-congratulatory almost like look well, yay me look what I did and it just that's a level of attention I don't usually ex- handle well or or bite honestly um I, t- I'm the person who will respond to a compliment with thank you uh I bought this dress at Ross or whatever you know like instead of just taking the compliment I'll have to like you know I have to minimize it in some way and um so I yeah no I I'm I'm better at it now but I was not doing any celebrating back then especially not with other people, you know, <laughs> maybe quietly in my head. Well, that's good though. We live and learn. And so everything now is hopefully a big celebration. I certainly know I'll be cheering you on. I'll be like, yes, we got it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's another reason why I like to, to, you know, to empower other authors, especially newer authors, like celebrate your wins and, and, it, and don't, don't compare yourself because, you know, so-and-so over here at the New York Times that's their win because they've, they've been working towards that, but you selling a hundred books for the first time is a win. It's a huge win, especially if those hundred people weren't your mom, like that's incredible, <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and be happy with that. And, and, and then keep setting your goals higher and higher and higher. You know, what would your three top marketing tips be for authors? Um, we've already talked about the first one, which is brand. Uh, that's so, so important. Like, it's like a life circle, right? It all goes in a circle. If you don't, if you don't know who you are, your book doesn't know who it is, then you're going to have a problem. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, for the second one, I would say, um, you need to learn an ad platform (laughs) just once. (laughs) If you want to just learn one, just learn one, but there's, there's almost no way, unless you're super ridiculously lucky to get your books in front of people. If you're not, willing to pay for advertising and learn advertising. So you don't throw money away on ads not working. Um, you can't rely on book bubs every month. Most people don't get them every month. Um, you know, I, I, I get them <laughs> <laughs> or, or at all. I mean, you just don't know. And that's the point. You can't control it. Like I've had eight this year, but the year before I had two, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So, um, so learn ads. And then the third thing would be, um, like support all of your friends but cross promo with the ones that have symmetry because it's going to affect everything from the way readers interpret things to the way Amazon interprets things. If you have people who write PNR, but you're Epic fantasy and they're sitting in your also bots, it confuses Amazon on who your target reader is. So, and that's hard. It's a hard delineation to make because you want to support everybody. And that's why I created like Queens of fantasy. Why do author uh, why, why I help you behind the scenes and stuff, because I want to support my friends, but I can't, I can't, I, I, I have to say no, if it's not, and it doesn't help them either. You know, it doesn't help either person. You can't compromise your brand and algorithm, which yeah. is completely understandable. So then what would you say your greatest challenge and accomplishment has been so far? Sorry, I had a fly. I was like, Oh, what is happening? <laughs> At least it's not a big spider. <laughs> I was thinking. Okay, my reaction would be very different if it was a spider, trust me. <laughs> oh, you're not used to them? <laughs> oh, I'm used to them, but I don't like them. <laughs> don't like them. <laughs> yeah, 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 some things you just don't get used to, I guess. Uh, my greatest accomplishment, I mean, I think 10 years of um, 10 years of, of writing is a big one because, you know, I I tend to get um, I tend to really jump into something and really stick with it if, um, if, but th- then I fizzle out and try something else. Right. And so when I decided to start publishing, I wanted it to be something that I did forever, but I didn't know that I could. And, um, every year I've learned more and more and more things. Each of those things I've learned have made me more and more, d- you know, uh, determined to make it a forever thing. Right. So I think the 10 year thing, um, yeah. And I, I honestly writing the trilogy was a big one for me that that was the moment I was like this is I this is I finally know exactly who I am 
<laughs> as an author. And so readers are going to know exactly what to get from me. Um, and I can be really clear with that. And that was a, a victory that it's kind of hard to put into words. So this is my favorite question to ask. What is the goal that you're chasing for Korea? What is the dream that you are chasing? Well, so there's like, you know, obviously I set pretty um, aggressive but realistic goals every year for myself, but the big pie in the sky dream is um, a series, like a Game of Thrones type series. You know, I think that would be it. And I actually think, you know, I used to think that'd be so cool to have your books adapted. Well, I don't know how adaptable the House of Crimson Clover is. I'm going to say on the scale of one to 10, probably a three. It's all over the place. That trilogy is adaptable as hell. <laughs> it is, it is, it's almost like it was made for screen, you know? Um, and I didn't, I didn't write it that way, but that's how it is. So that would be my pie in the sky. I can't wait for it to come out. I definitely believe, and I can't wait for it to come out. So I put in good vibes. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going to manifest it. Yes. Yes. Let's manifest. I have a segment called speed dating with an author. So you and I are going to go on a very romantic date. I lit a candle. I created ambience. And basically what it is, is five rapid questions. Are you ready? Yes. What is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Every moment of my life. Fantastic. <laughs> so you're just a very clumsy person. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My mom used to call me Gracie <laughs> when I was a kid. I, I, I trip up the stairs, not down them. <laughs> Gosh, that's so funny. That, well, I mean, as long as you haven't seriously <laughs> hurt yourself from it. Um, Amazingly, no. <laughs> yes. Well, yes. Your elegant class. Yeah. I make it look good. <laughs> what are the three words that would best describe you? Passionate, uh, driven and resourceful uh what is the song that would best describe you um i don't know but it'd probably be something by tori amos in the late 90s <laughs> yeah cool what um is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about so i'm not going to demonstrate it for anybody but i am i make an impeccable dolphin sound <laughs> i want to i can do a chihuahua <laughs> 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 Why are you laughing at me? You do a dolphin. I just what is it you want to say? Well, shame me. <laughs> we're, just, we're just gonna leave that like untouched. <laughs> we'll be like, we can do this, but we're not gonna display it because we have a little bit of pride somewhere. We have some self-respect, <laughs> it's not much. <laughs> Um, what what is your life motto? Uh, YOLO, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it. You only live once. Get it done. I Sarah, I have had so much fun today. What? <laughs> I do. What do we need to know? What's coming out? Where do we stalk you? Everything we need to know. Yeah. Um, I um, Well, so what's coming out? Raven in the Rush, December 14th. Uh, standalone fantasy romance forbidden love super good uh and then the next five books i'm writing um which will some which four of the four of which will come out in 2022 um are again all standalone uh fantasy romances and the next one is going to be a hardcore enemy to lovers i mean like real enemies to lovers um and i'm writing it now and it's super fun um and then yeah i spend most of my time on instagram which is just my name, Sarah M. Gradit, and uh, my website is sarahmgradit.com. Um, and actually all my handles except Twitter are Sarah M. Gradit. <laughs> so um, my Twitter is the writer Sarah. So yeah, amazing. Well, that keeps it easy then. And what is the name of your reader group as well? Of your Facebook? Yeah. Group? So, so that is probably where I'm the most active on Facebook. Uh, it's the Kingdom of the White Sea Reader Group. It's not private. So um, anybody can find it and yeah it doesn't people don't have to read my books to come in they just have to be um polite and like to talk about fantasy and yeah, yeah. and be nice <laughs> yeah be nice well thank you so much again for coming on again I've had such a blast yeah this was great thank you for inviting me yeah absolutely and who knows watch your space maybe we'll be able to get you back on next year as well yeah I'd love that awesome all right Sarah I'll talk to you later bye Bye.